good afternoon. I'm glad to see you all here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin Foley. I'm the chairman of the convention. And today we're going to have the first in a three-part series of lectures here at our 78th anniversary convention by Mitch Ernst, the general subject of the group of presentations will be nonprofit organization management and fundraising. Mitch has served the Central States Numismatic Society as a governor and served with distinction. Uh, and we're delighted to have him here today to uh, enrich our lives and give us some new ideas. So with that, Mitch, I will turn the proceedings over to you because they've come to hear you and not me. So. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, hello, everyone. I'm, as Kevin introduced, I'm Mitch Ernst. Um, I have my Master's of Divinity from Royal Roberts University. I uh, graduated in 1984. I have my Certificate in Fundraising Management from the University of Nebraska at Omaha last year. Uh, I went back to school after serving on nonprofit boards and being utterly amazed how many nonprofits do not understand how nonprofits are supposed to operate. So today we'll be um, kind of delving into fundraising basics. Uh, you know the old adage from the military. Please go back. Uh, the old uh, someone asks someone in the military, "Well, what? How do they do that secret ops?" And he said, "Well, I could tell you, but I have to shoot you. Uh, I could go over everything I've learned in the last two years, but then you'd shoot me." So I, I don't think we want to do that. Um, in one of the handouts, does everyone have the handouts? Um, they're up here on the table. Uh, the one that's entitled on the front cover, Introduction to Development. If you open it up, there's a little survey and questionnaire. Um, if you could just take some time right now with uh, there's pens and start put some answers of what you think uh, what you think the answers are, and we will go through in the presentation. We'll see how close you come. Okay. Uh, all of the following is predicated on your organization be a 501c3. If you're a, a if you, that is the only organization that can accept donations. So uh, this is all predicated on that. Uh, we will discuss the differences between C3s and C7s, C4s, etc. in the program on Saturday at noon. Development is a process whereby contributions from all potential sources are solicited in a planned and orderly fashion in order to best complement the stated purpose and goals of the organization and to fulfill short-term needs and long-term strategic plans. Uh, this was my instructor at the University of Nebraska, Paul Strawhacker. He owns a nonprofit uh, consultation and fundraising business in, um, in Nebraska. He goes around the country and helps nonprofits uh, with their organizations. You know, as I, I highlighted the word planned, does your organization have a plan? Does it do any strategic planning? Is your organization even prepared for the day it closes? Uh, it's nice to have all those things lined up and ready to know what you can and should do with whatever resources you have on that day your membership decides, you know, with, there's nothing to go on for. Um, one of my favorite qu quotes from the movie The Hunt for the Red, Oct for Red October, uh, Fred Thompson, his rear admiral painter, says, Russians don't take a dump, son, without a plan. And in fundraising, it should be the same thing. Uh, we should not even begin even thinking about fundraising without having a plan. Okay. The development process is like building a house. You know, you just don't have people go out and start throwing stuff together and say, oh, I think it would look good this way, or I think... No, you develop a plan. You have the idea first. You develop a plan. You set a budget. 
And in the budget, what do you do? You make sure you have the resources or you decide where you're going to get the resources from. The same is true in, fun in development. You notice I'm not saying, uh, uh, fundraising and development are not necessarily the same things. Fundraising is part of the development process. Uh, development is the whole structure of um, raising money for your organization. You build the infrastructure for your plan, you lay the foundation, you build the structure, and along the way you pay attention to details. The plan is important, but having, a, having everyone on the same page helps avoid problems. <laughs> you know, sometimes you think you have a great plan and this is how it ends up looking after a few committee meetings. Anybody been in those committee meetings <laughs> where you go in and you think, hey, we got a great plan and it ends up looking like that at the end, okay. Uh, this is on one of your handouts, the four pillars of fundraising. Uh, mission. Uh, how many people are involved with numismatic organizations in this room, in, in leadership or whatever? Does your board know your mission? Can they recite it? Do they know it by heart? Leadership believes in the mission. They don't believe in just serving on the board. They don't just believe in getting a name for themselves or have, be able to say, put board member on their business card because it looks good. They want to be a board member because they believe in the mission. Uh, you have to, the other pillar, systems. How to implement the mission. And then donors, they believe in the mission as well because the leadership shares the mission with the donors. Boards govern, they don't manage. When I first heard that in my classes, it is I mean, it made sense, but I had never thought of it that way before. Um, but when boards start trying to manage that's where you get into trouble because individual board members want something done this way or they want something done that way. That's what your management team is there to do. The board governs to give basic guidelines and directions and then you let your management team carry that out. Nonprofit should have a management team that the board believes in and can bring about the mission of the organization. Pet projects by board members cause problems. Uh, do you know your mission statement? Um, my family's been involved with 4-H since my son was just a little squirt. I googled 4-H and this is the first page that comes up, their mission statement. Engaging youth to reach their fullest potential while advancing the field of youth development. Clear identification understanding of your mission keeps everyone on the same page. Um, if someone comes on your board and they think your mission is to um, fold paper and the other people think it's to make paper airplanes, you're not ever going to get anywhere. You have to have a clear identification of the mission. Uh, I've joined many, uh, a, a few boards that when I was elected, mission was nowhere mentioned in any of the materials that they gave me. Uh, start board meetings by reciting it. It may sound elementary, but this is your mission, is your organization. This is what you are. Your mission is what you are. It's your identity. Start your board meetings by reciting it. Board members might hate it. They might think it's juvenile. There's a lot of juvenile behavior at board meetings, so why not add this to it? Uh, you know, I mean, seriously, recite it, get to know it. Your board should know your mission statement by heart. Put it on your website, your letterhead, your business cards. As I said, your mission is your identity. Okay. 
Uh, two publications I edit uh, is the Nebraska Numismatic Association Journal, uh, the Omaha Coin Club News. When I started doing these, I put our mission statement right on the front of each publication. Well, actually, this is under our uh, return address. But I put it on the front of everything. So every time someone reads one of our newsletters, they see our mission. OK. Uh, the components of a development program, the tripod of fundraising. There's three basic uh, forms of fundraising for most nonprofits. You have planned giving, uh, annual giving, planned giving, you know, like estate planning, that type of thing. Annual giving, where you have giving programs, where you set up things for your membership or uh, your donors every year. You know, you've all seen, it. I'll give $25 a year, I'll give $100 a year, whatever. Capital giving programs, that's where you want to raise money for a specific capital need of your organization. To get that done, you'll need public relations, sharing the mission, a case statement, why the mission is important, and volunteers to carry it out. Okay. Annual giving programs are the mainstay of fundraising a development process. Annual giving programs can be in the form of direct mail, memorials, donor clubs, special events. Uh, all those are ways that you can do annual giving and they provide ongoing support to meet your operational needs. Uh, does anyone have any examples from your organization of any uh, annual giving that you do? Uh, I'll, I'll discuss why annual giving is not done in numismatic organizations. Uh, next. In my, in my experience, numismatic organizations, annual giving equals dues in members' minds. Dues are viewed at, by members as their annual contribution to the organization. Okay, next. How many organizations here can say that their membership dues meets their obligation for the year? <laughs> no, no, okay. Um, many if not most numismatic organizations offer life memberships at a discounted prorated rate over time. So in essence, you motivate and encourage your members to give even less over their lifetimes. I mean, wow. So, okay, next. Again, in my experience at the local and state level, many if not most life members then feel entitled. They go, I've, I've given my lifetime contribution. I'm entitled to a newsletter for the rest of my life. I'm entitled to free admission to shows. I'm entitled. All because, say in the case of the Nebraska Numismatic Association, our, our lifetime membership is 100 bucks. So for $100, they can spend the next 50 years living on their $2 a year donation to that organization. Um, they've made their lifetime contribution, and now I don't need to do anything else. Okay, Sam. For the customers of a numismatic organization, dealers that purchase tables and your advertisers who buy advertising, they view their fees as their annual contribution. Okay. How many people here have noticed that show revenues, advertising rates are not keeping up with the increase of venue cost, the cost of producing newsletters, the cost of just running your club. <laughs> okay. Rent, the cost of your venue, your meeting room, printing and postage. A lot of clubs are having to resort to electronic newsletters 
just simply because it's so much a cost effective compared to print newsletters because they're just relying on dues and um, uh, show revenues. Uh, security. Everyone who's ever helped put on a show or, or uh, manage a show, no, this is not cheap. <laughs> um, I could ask you what some of the issues your club are dealing with, but I know <laughs> most of them. <laughs> so I won't go there. Sir, I don't know you uh, in particular. Or do you have any issues like from a club you're involved with that you may want to? Yes. Yeah, we have a, we had the Ohio State Numismatic Association that was broken up by people that didn't pay dues for three or four years. We divided the money up. Uh, the guy that was pretending to be the president uh, was uh, not taking the Constitution because he could only be president twice. I was a vice president for 12 years, different levels, and could not get a uh, an audit. I asked for the books one time. They got lost. <laughs> the Central states could be in the same position next year. Well, because he's vice president here. There's bylaws that you're already. Yeah. Well. Well. You have bylaws, but when you have. Well. The. Uh, versus Cleveland. Yeah. Well, if you come to my presentation tomorrow, I'll talk about the problems with elected boards right. compared to appointed boards. Uh, solutions. I wish I had a magic ball. I wish I had some type of elixir I could put in everyone's drink and, it, and we would all come see, have this ma magnificent vision of what we can do to help our hobby and our organizations. Uh, but the numismatic culture has been so long established and the problem is it's still defended. Uh, cheap dues, free admission, low or no cost events and seminars. When I was taking my fundraising class, they asked us what organization we were representing and I represented, I, I said I represented a certain one. And, and I told them what was being done. And they said, well, how much do you charge for this full day seminar with food and everything provided for the attendees? I said, $15 a person. There were 30 people in that room and they, you could hear all of their jaws collectively drop at the idea of anyone being able to hold an all day seminar, have speakers, put them up for the event, and, and pay for food for $15 um, at the time. Um, but th this is the numismatic culture. We're in a hobby where people brag about their expensive coins, but yet brag about how cheap they are. So, okay, next. Uh, deficits don't necessarily show how charitable you are or your organization is. Many times it only shows you don't know how to fund your organization properly. A nonprofit is still a business and you need to stay in business to fulfill your mission. That's why you're in or that's why you exist. Fulfill your mission. Okay. Uh, capital campaigns, these are used to raise large amount of money in a short period of time. Uh, again, this is, I, I'm including like churches, um, library, other, you know, other types of nonprofit construction projects, capital expenditures, uh, major equipment acquisitions, you know, like a club, you may have to buy new showcases for your show or even just for some clubs that are on a tight budget, buying electrical cords could be a, a, a budget breaker for them. So they, it's good to know how to raise money for that. Um, anybody have any uh, examples of a capital campaign that they might have for, their, for your club that you could think of that you might need to raise some funds for? Okay. Planned giving. 
the untapped treasure of the numismatic world. We have people out there with huge, wonderful estates, collections. Um, but we have not been good at explaining them how they can share their love of their hobby that they love and enjoy so much with future generations. And the way they can do that is with, with planned giving. Planned giving programs encourage the long-term financial stability of your organization while providing the donor with security and tax advantages because it's tax deductible. They're publications and they're all asking you to put you in there and that you're right. Money. Right. A and A is really going after that. Right. I don't see why all the rest of us shouldn't for our organization. Right. And and this is this is applicable for even small local clubs. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll use Omaha Coin Club again as an example. Aubrey Beebe was a longtime member of Omaha Coin Club. All of his bequests went to the ANA. Not a dime went to Omaha Coin. Or they didn't know it, or they didn't know it. I mean, that's the same way. Or, they or, 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 or right. Or it could be, you know, they're just a little, you know, group of guys in Omaha. I'm just saying there's a lot of reasons why it didn't happen. Right. But again, if you're, not, if you're not out there, and if they didn't sell it, it, but we have to sell it. Right. right. And, in your, in your planning. Right, and what your gift can mean to right. us. Right, that's what, we, I know our guys have not done that. Right, so. yeah, yeah, it's all about, this is a, a, a Greek proverb, but just put nonprofit instead of civilization. A nonprofit flourishes when people plant trees under which they will never sit. Mm -hmm. And that's what planned giving is all about, okay. Um, next, good public relations, what we were just talking about, communicating the need for financial support. If you don't say anything, you're not going to get it. Right. And in the heyday of a lot of clubs, like when Mr. Beebe was alive, clubs were doing good. They had, right. they had big conventions, their, the costs were down on things, and so it not necessarily uh, needed or, or were perceived as needing. Um, but today's a different animal, okay? The case statement, the rationale for making a gift to your organization. You have to make your case, and there's, um, okay, next. These are all support, uh, things that support your fundraising. Volunteers, instrumental in organizing events and asking for gifts. The people who are active in your organization, who enjoy it, who participate, who believe in it, those are the ones who should be selling it. How do you make your case to support your organization? I asked a longtime member in Nebraska about needing to um, file our status to become a, a C3 organization, his response was, who would want to give us anything? This is a, a gentleman who was one of the founders. Uh, all, he doesn't believe. I, I'm sorry. He, it, but yet, organizations around the country are full of members who don't believe in their own organization. They believe in it enough to come monthly for the, for the auction, or they come monthly to get donuts and coffee, or to see their friend, or to do some buying and trading. But as far as really believing in their organization and its mission, they don't do it. Okay. <clears throat> How do you get past that mentality, or should you even try, if your own members don't believe enough in your organization or what you are doing, no one else will. It starts at home. 
there comes a time that you have to sell the idea or let it go. Okay. What is the case statement? Okay. Why are you in business? That is, what is the problem you're trying to alleviate or resolve? Or what are you trying to accomplish with your nonprofit? This is an expansion of your mission statement. Outcomes. What are your outcomes? You have to have outcomes. You're, everything in, in, in Fundrate, you need outcomes-based planning and, and um, guides so you can know how you're reaching your goals. Um, these should be measurable, what I just said, publicly observable and not, well, we just want to improve lives or we just want to give people a, a comfortable hobby to enjoy. Um, what are you specifically trying to accomplish with your programs or your services? Okay. How is your organization different from other organizations? Uh, when I was on uh, the board of central states, I really appreciated, I thought this was the organization that went to collectors. We, uh, central states went out and held seminars at people's places. Other organizations expect the collectors to come to them. Central states reaches out to, the, to their membership, you know, with their DVD programs, their educational outreaches, their seminars. Central States is the organization that reaches out. Um, that's, how I, that's how I perceive Central States being different. Um, but you need to identify in your own organization what makes you different from other organizations. Then how will you achieve your program and service goals? These are all part of this case. When you go up to a donor, this is what you should be laying out for them. This is what makes us different. This is what makes us special. And this is how we plan on, on doing it. And what methods will you use? Um, you know, this doesn't have to be exhaustive. You don't have to go into every detail about how you want to, what methods you're going to use to carry it out. Uh, but, you know, it's good to have some points. Okay, Sam. Uh, next, what are the accomplishments has your nonprofit achieved? Some of them just like to brag, well, we've been around for 60 years. Well, is that really an accomplishment? You know, I mean, uh, people give to successful organizations and they tend to avoid giving to struggling ones. I mean, really. Um, as I said, I got my Master of Divinity from Oral Roberts University. I was there when Oral said, I need $80 million or God's going to take me home. That was brutal. Who wants to give to an organization and they think God's going to kill you? You know, that's not, people want to see success. They want to hear positive things. So, Give, um, give reasons why you're a success and, and um, show them what you're doing right. Okay. What's the history of your organization? When it was founded, by whom? How is it financed? Is it just by dues? What's your organization's philosophy and how does it work? Does it work even work with other nonprofits? You know, are there any collaborative efforts? Um, anyone have any comments or anything about this up to this point? Okay. Again, from my seminary days, we all heard the, from the Sermon on the Mount, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. This is fundraising. You have to ask. If you don't ask, how does anyone know? You have to seek those who, who you are looking for as potential donors. And you do have to knock and do the, I thought the, the acronym is kind of cool. I never thought of that before, but the acronym is ASK in that. Why do people stumble when they have the opportunity to do the ASK? They have a belief system that says it's not right to ask. Some people believe. 
I'm not supposed to bother people with this. I'm not supposed to ask. Next. Or, subconsciously, they don't like to be asked themselves. Next. They lack confidence. And this, I, I mean, this is true. It, it's embarrassing sometimes. And, and one reason you lack confidence is for the next, you fear being rejected. And these are all emotions we all probably have dealt with in one way or another, um, just in everyday life doing things. Okay, next, Sam. Uh, this is on your, um, your handout. This is the breakdown of the amounts of dollars. Let me just ask a quick question. Out of individuals, corporations, bequests, and foundations, what do you think is the largest contributor to nonprofit in fundraising and nationally? Anyone have any idea? You know. <laughs> okay, next. Individuals, who would, have, would you have even guessed? In most people's mind, I know when I took my courses, I was sure it was, you watch PBS at night. This is provided by the foundation of, you know, and the corporation of has provided. And, and again, we think of planned giving. Oh, that's huge. Individuals, this is all like, your annual giving. These, these are the people who give 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars a year to your organization as a gift. Um, fundraising has become a trendy solution for many problems. They think it's a quick answer, but no matter how much fundraising a numismatic organization does, it does not and will not change the culture shift that's happening right now. Clubs and hobby organizations are not as popular as they were years ago. Fundraising should not be used to preserve the past, but instead it should be used to adapt to the present, to present needs, and provide for the future. That's how we should be looking at fundraising. Um, fundraising in its most, is not designed to re uh, reverse deficits. Why? Because fundraising is a process that it takes so much time. Uh, that's why sometimes you need those capital campaigns. Those are what you need to bring in the quick cash if you're having uh, problems. But b development and fundraising in general is a process where, as we said at the start, where you go to all potential sources and you solicit them in a planned and orderly fashion to accomplish your goals. Okay. Donors are investors. That was one thing that surprised me when I was taking this too. I never looked at a donor as an investor. They're just investing without looking for a return. The type, what type of return do you think most donors are looking for? Next right. Feeling of satisfaction. Correct. Yeah, that self, you know, that I, it makes me feel good that I've given. And the tax deduction is a big thing. That's why you need to be a C3. Um, okay. Donors want to see how committed your organization is to its own mission. Do employees volunteer outside of their job? Do they do anything uh, for the organization? Oh, I'm just repeating myself. Does the board donate? If the board doesn't believe enough in the mission to support it, why should your prospects? Um, in most uh, grant settings, before, when you go through the grant process, filling out all the paperwork. Grants are brutal, by the way. If you think you're gonna raise money by doing grants, they are brutal. You have to write the foundation. They send you specific things that you have to answer, and, they are, and you have to 
you have to word things the way they want it because they get so many requests, it has to be done in a certain way. But the problem is, one of the questions on those grant applications are, what percentage of your board gives? If you say 5%, you think you're going to get that grant. <laughs> no. No. Um, most, if not all, nonprofit organizations ask for, if not require, board members to donate. Uh, there are exceptions, like a board member for a homeless shelter who is also a client. They have a, a client on the board because they want to know the perspective of that person being helped. Um, but most nonprofits ask board members to donate, and uh, it's written in the board uh, responsibilities. That's another thing I've noticed from serving on boards. Those things should be, when, uh, say, numismatic organizations, when there's a board election, that should all be laid out before someone raises this. These are your responsibilities. If you want to run for this board, this is what's expected of you. Because I think that will weed out a lot of it because a friend of somebody who's being kind of disruptive on the board, who recruits a friend to join him in that, say, oh, you don't need to do anything. Don't listen to them. If it's in writing, if they get it before they run, there cannot be any arguments. There cannot be anyone saying, well, I didn't know I was, no one told me. You need to let your prospective board members, whether they're elected or appointed, know what they're getting in for. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, an engaged board is a happy board. Um, sadly, I've been in some of these board meetings. Um, engagement is not the same as management. Many, many board members think uh, engagement means trying to tell, their sta tell the staff of the organization how they should fold napkins, I mean down to the most minutia of the organization, but that's not their job. What is engagement by a board member? Recruitment of members, and what kind of members? The ones that believe in your mission, who who want to, the, to um, advance the mission of your organization. Engagement, what is engagement by a board member? Fundraising, that's how they're engaged. How simple, I mean, it isn't sitting around telling the staff what they need to do, no. You give them the money so that they can do their job. That's board engagement. Another way, board engagement, volunteering. You're the face of this organization. Why does no one ever see you doing anything? This is how a board is engaged, not by telling the staff what they need to do. Also, board members should put mission fulfillment above personal pet projects. Where there's a will, there's a way. Um, is your board, is your organization willing to commit to fundraising? It's not an overnight solution. It takes time, it takes planning, it takes commitment. Are they willing to wait to see the, the benefits come back from their investment? Because honestly, there is an investment by a board into fundraising. They have to invest to see the long-term results. And is your board patient enough to wait for the returns down the road? It's not an overnight solution. Um, after I graduated from, or, graduated from Oral Roberts, I had the privilege of working for the ministry for a few years. And I one day uh, was in President Roberts' office, and I saw this sign. He wasn't there, of course. I saw this sign on his desk, and I loved it. Make no little plans here. Your organization should always be thinking big. Not survival, not always thinking, why make little plans? If you're gonna make a plan, make a big one. If you fall, 
50% short, you're still ahead of your small plan. They say I dream too big. I say they think too small. If there's a will, there's a way. If there's no will, there's no way. If you are on, could you go back? If you are on a, are on a board that is full of obstructionists, people who are satisfied, say in a small club. It's been around for nearly 80 years. You swear that most of the membership were founding members because they're so, I mean, and they're just satisfied in letting the club die around them. They don't have a vision. They don't have the will to go on. If there's no will, in many cases, there's no way. Okay. So what can a club do? Um, there's a lot of fun and creative ways to raise money. Imitate somebody. We, think of all the fun events you see going on at, from nonprofits in your community. It doesn't have to be numismatically related. It doesn't have to be about coins. It doesn't have to be about numismatics. Imitation is the highest form of flattery. Copy somebody. I know in Omaha, 20 years ago, there'd be one or two fundraising banquets with a f special speaker. Now there's 15 or 20 a year. Um, find like-minded people to help carry out your plan. Oh, that's right. Don't forget to plan. Wow, what a great idea. Selling non-branded merchandise. We all see t-shirts, hats. Humane societies are great at doing that. You know, they put a cute picture of a puppy on a shirt or on a, on a reusable bag or, you know, use products to help sell your brand. Because your brand, and put your mission statement on it. Leave your mission statement on. Even if it's just a short and condensed version, put your mission statement on whatever you brand. And don't be worried that someone's going to wear your shirt and think that you're a cancer doctor when they go, well, go out to, you know, how ridiculous is that? Or you're a veterinarian because you're wearing a Humane Society shirt. You have a brand. Use it. Sell it. Let it work for you. Okay. An event. A golf outing. It doesn't have to be numismatically related. How many, golf, how many coin dealers probably love to play golf? Plan a golf outing before your convention or, or your coin show. A lot of golf courses, I know in Omaha, a lot of golf courses work with nonprofits all the time. They give you, they, like, their contribution to organization is you can use the course for this day. We'll just shut it down to the public. This is yours. Um, dinner with a guest speaker. We've all seen that. Uh, in Omaha just recently, uh, the Salvation Army had Jewel come in and speak, uh, the singer. Uh, she spoke about her days being homeless. A wine tasting. There's local vineyards everywhere. Team up with a local winery for a coins and corks night. Uh, that's trademarked, by the way. <laughs> um, a beer tasting. How many local breweries are there? Have a coins and casks event. It doesn't have to be numismatically related. Do you know how many people just want to go out and drink beer? But use their, use their desire to have a beer tasting to benefit your club or your organization. Use their desire to go out for a wine tasting to benefit your club. How about a concert with a local band? Team that up with the, with the beer night. And what are you doing when you do this? You open yourself to a whole new audience. Well, I didn't know there was a coin club. How many of you, I didn't know there was a coin club here. Ever since I became president of the Omaha Coin Club, I, I can't tell you the number. I didn't know there was a, and we're on the web. We, 
Adver you know, we think we're advertising. And the story always is, my grandfather had this collection, you know. So do something that reaches out to people you know, normally don't do. Okay. Oh, well, that's okay. It, there's a lot of things you can do if you think outside the box. Okay. Has anyone looked into the nonprofits on Facebook page? It is awesome. Um, I have Facebook accounts for both the Omaha Coin Club and the Nebraska. They send you weekly um, reports on how your page is performing compared to the previous week. How many views, how many likes, how many... I mean, it's awesome, and they give you... It, they just break it all down for you, and, and you see if you're being productive or not. They also have tools and products that help you with um, fundraising, events, insights. I mean, it, it, it's really awesome. But the page on Facebook is called Nonprofits for Facebook. Look it up. It's, it's, it's great. Uh, there's other resources on Facebook. Well, uh, this one called Mobile Cause. There's a handout from them called A New Generation of Giving. In that, you'll see how the new generation makes up, I can't remember what the statistic is. I'm going to walk in front of the screen for a second. It's the Millennials and Gen Xers. They make up 87%. Let's see if I can read this right. 87% of Millennials gave to charity, donated to charity last year. Gen Xers give 465 annually. Both are motivated to give by their passion. So, and, and how do you think Gen Xers and Millennials give? Exactly. This is their giving device. They do everything. This, this is where they live. And if you want to reach them, if you want them to give to you, you need to reach out. If you mail them something, trash. Um, they don't like using cash or checks. The mail goes in the trash. Phone calls. Text them. Send a text. They'll read a text. They won't answer your phone call. Uh, but this, this is another organization, Mobile Cause. They're on Facebook. They have great resources there as well. Okay. So in summary, development is as much an art as science. The old saying, you'll never know unless you ask, is very true in fundraising. Fundraising goes hand in hand with friend making. Fundraising is all about relationships. You don't get married overnight, well, at least you shouldn't. <laughs> and you don't make friends that way either. Friendships take time. It's all about relationships. They take time, so do donors, to develop, <coughs> to develop and build the confidence in a donor and their belief in what you're doing. It takes time. Don't you? People know if, you, if you're trying to use them, if you're just hitting them up for a quick buck. Don't use people. Make friends. Friends like you. They want to support you. They want to see you succeed. Make friends. Uh, although it's true that you can begin a fundraising program anywhere in the process, but your success will be enhanced if you carefully plan a long-term strategy. Plan, plan, plan. Um, every activity you do should be a prelude to your next step. Always keep what's next in mind. It's all about relationships. And as Thomas Jefferson said, I find that the harder I work, the more luck I seem to have. It takes work. Thank you. Any questions?